So I'd like to start by giving a quick rundown of how this evening's talk is going to go. So first I'm going to give a quick introduction on Elijah, um, who he was and where he came from, and then go through incidents in his life that tells us what kind of man Elijah was and, and what characteristics he had. And then hopefully, when we look at them, we can start to put those characteristics in our lives and live more like Elijah did. So we could turn to the previous chapter that we read, chapter 17, and this is where we first read of Elijah. So we can look at chapter 17, verse 1. <coughs> and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead. Okay, so we, we first read his name, and we can look at a concordance, and find out that his name means, My God is Yahweh, or whose God is Yahweh. So either way, we look at the meaning of this name. He was a man of God. Okay, we instantly see what kind of man Elijah was. And we also read, he was a Tishbite. And, and this is the only place we find the uh, Tishbite mentioned, which means he came from Tishba, which was on the east of Jordan. And we are also told he was an, an inhabitant of Gilead. And if we look at the Hebrew word for inhabitant there, we, we see it's the word Tosha, and it's translated as, as inhabitant once here, and translated as stranger or sojourner 13 times. <laughs> One of them we find in Genesis, if you, if you could turn there with me please, Genesis chapter 23. So we find Abraham looking to bury his wife. Genesis chapter 23, beginning at verse 1. And Sarah was 177 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kerjath Arba, the same as Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. So stranger and sojourner, the same words, same Hebrew word that we read in First of Kings. So Elijah was a sojourner. He didn't belong in Gilead. And yes, maybe it was from, because he was from a different place. But I also think it implies he wasn't an inhabitant of earthly things. If you could turn with me uh, forward a couple of books to Leviticus chapter 20, please. Here we see something in the law that God says to the children of Israel that is quite interesting when thinking about strange, being strangers or sojourners. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 7. Sanctify yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. So we know that holy in the Bible can mean to be separate. And so the children of Israel here are being told to be separate, and so are we. Elijah was not of the land he dwelled in. He was a sojourner. And to finish off the point, can you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11, please? A chapter of the, of the giants of faith about being strangers in their lands. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 13 these all died in faith not having received the promises but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that there were strangers and pilgrims on the earth so all of these were strangers and pilgrims Elijah was a stranger and so should we be a stranger in this land we shouldn't see the world around us as our home but, with the current reading in Hebrews verse 14, For though they say such things, declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So these people's homes were the kingdom. They did not belong in the world that they were in. So we could turn back to First of Kings, please. Still in chapter 17. So we find out where Elijah, Elijah came from and what his name means. And if we carry on reading verse 1, we find out what he's doing. So Elijah, Elijah said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. 
So Ahab here was the king of Israel at the, at the time, and Elijah goes to the king to say that there will be no rain. And we can see who he is talking on behalf of, it says in the verse, the Lord God of Israel, before whom I stand. So by reading this verse, we can see what a faithful man he was. His first action and his, his first instruction to follow was to go to the king and say there was a drought. That's, that's like one of us going to David Cameron and saying, there's going to be no oil left. That's it. That's it. It's finished now. Okay? And, and this must have required great faith. He is then told in the, in the next verse, uh, well, verse 3, to go and hide. And, and we see his obedience here to do what God had told him. So reading verse 3, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Kereth, that is before Jordan. So the Hebrew meaning of the word Kereth is a cut, or cut off. And again we see his separation from the world around him. He was cut off from the world that he lived in. And here he's told that he was going to be fed by ravens, by the brook. And again, it demonstrates his faith that God would provide for him. And I wonder how much more easier our lives would be if we could trust in God the way Elijah did, knowing that he would provide for him and that he always provides for us. So the ravens feed him and he drinks of the brook in verse 5. But eventually it runs out in verse 7. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. So by looking at the concordance again we can see that sorry. And then God sent him to Zarephath in verse 9. And if we look at the concordance uh, for Zarephath, we can see why God sent him there. It means a, a smelting or a place of refinery. So if you could turn with me to 1 Peter, please, we see an example of how we can be refined metals. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So Elijah was being tried here. He was being smelted into a finer piece of gold. And, and we have to try and recognise that when things happen in our, in our lives. When things don't go right. Don't, don't go wrong. Don't go right. When things don't go right, when they go wrong. Um, we can't just stand and complain. God has his reasons, and, and they're not always foreseeable for us. We can't always see them, but he has his reasons. So we can turn back to 1 Kings, please. So Elijah went to Zarephath, and we see in verse 9, which belongeth to Zidon. Now, he goes to Zidon to meet a woman, and it eventually heals her child, which we'll find out in a minute. But if you can turn with me to Mark chapter 7, we see Jesus doing a very similar action to what Elijah does here. So Mark chapter 7, verse, starting with verse 24. Mark 7, 24. And from thence Jesus arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon. So Sidon there is, is the same as Sidon. And entered into a an house, and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. For a certain woman, whose younger daughter had an unclean spirit, heard of him, and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek and a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, let, not, let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread, and to cast it unto the dogs. And she had answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying, go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. So we can see it here, or we'll see later on, that Elijah is a type of Christ. They went to the same place, both met a woman, and they both healed their child. So here, here, he is a type of the most faithful and righteous man who ever lived. And this tells us a lot about what Elijah was like. So we could turn back to 1 Kings, please. Probably keep a marker there. Um, so, in, back in 1 Kings, we see Elijah finds a woman gathering sticks in verse 10. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. So God has asked Elijah to travel to Zarephath, 
And then we see in verse 11, he asks for food. And in verse 12, we find out that she doesn't have much food. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me, and my son, that we may eat it and die. So he's, he's told, Elijah's told that a widow will sustain him. But when he gets there, he finds out this woman is very poor, and he still has the faith to ask her. Um, so we, we are blessed to know that where, where our next meal is coming from. And I doubt that many of us will ever struggle with that. But there are plenty of people in the UK and, and around the world that will struggle. And how would we feel if we took the last meal, meal off of one of those people? It's not that Elijah was selfish and only thinking of himself. He was commanded by God to ask this widow for food, and he did. And it must have, again, demanded great faith and once again obedience to ask this woman to sacrifice herself and son for him. But we see that God has a plan. If we look at verse 14. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And in a way, once again, we see a type of Christ in what Elijah does. He gives it for a short time, but he gives it everlasting life. Just as Jesus gives us the chance of eternal life. But just like the woman, we need to give everything to Jesus so that we might have that opportunity of eternal life. So we've talked about Elijah being obedient to God, but here we see the widow being obedient to Elijah. He must have been a trustworthy character. The widow could tell that God was at the forefront of what he did. And I wonder if after a short conversation with someone in the world, that they could tell that we were a Christadelphian. He goes on to stay with the widow and her son for a year. We read that in verse 15. But in verse 17, we learn about the widow's son's illness. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? So we see in verse 18 that Elijah is separated again. The widow calls him a man of God. And I'd like to look at some of the other people in the Bible that are described as men of God. We could start in Deuteronomy chapter 33, please. So the widow could tell he was a man of God. He was different. Deuteronomy chapter 33. And verse 1. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. So here we see a great man of faith described as a man of God. We could turn forward to First Samuel, please. We find another. First Samuel chapter nine. I'm sure you can all guess who I'm going to mention. 1 Samuel chapter 9 verse 6 um, Saul is sent to look for Samuel and he said unto him Behold now there is in, in the city a man of God and he is an honourable man all that he saith comes surely to pass now let us go thither peradventure he can show us our way that we should go and finally in, in Nehemiah chapter 12 please someone who was a great king of Israel is also described as the, a man of God Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 24. And the chief, chief of the Levites, Hashabiah, Sherebiah, and Jeshua, the son of Cadmiel, with their brethren over against them, to praise and to give thanks according to the commandment of David, the man of God. And we see again in verse 36 towards the end. With the musical instruments of David, the man of God, and as we described before them. So David is described as this man of God as well. So we see these incredible men all described as, as men or men of God. So what would, call, what would someone call us? So when people, I'm sure you know it, but when someone can't remember your name, what would they say? Would they say, um, oh yeah, the, the Ferrari guy over there, or because you like cars, or would it be, oh yeah, the, the Man United guy, because you support Man United? Or would they say, oh yeah, no, the, the religious one? What do people see us doing in the world? Would they know that you're religious? 
They knew it about all these men. And they knew it about Elijah from the way he lived his life. Turn back, turn back to 1 Kings, please. So Elijah goes on to heal the child that was sick in verse 21. And through prayer, he raises the child. He still recognises that his power comes from God. And that only through God he can raise the widow's child. So, so must we, likewise, pray to our God when we have choices to make in our lives or something important is coming up, just as Elijah did. So Elijah raised a widow's son from the dead, or was pretty much dead. If you could turn with me to Hebrews 11, we've been there already, talking about sojourners. But here there's another link to Elijah towards the end of the chapter. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, and David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. And we keep on going to 35. Women raised their dead, raised, women received their dead, raised to life again. So here we see he raised a woman's dead to life and we also read earlier on subdued kingdoms. Elijah did that with, with the drought. If you could turn back to 1 Kings, please. And to the next chapter, to the chapter that we had read. So 1 Kings chapter eight, 18, looking at verse 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And again we see this obedience that Elijah was told to go and find Ahab, the man that he told in chapter 17 verse 1, that there be no rain. Ahab's country would have been falling apart with no rain. And as far as he was concerned, it was Elijah's fault. So... And also we see that great faith again, that Elijah went to this king. And then we meet Obadiah in, in verse 3, who was, the, who was the governor of Ahab's house. And I won't dwell much on Obadiah's words tonight, because we're looking at Elijah. Um, if you follow me to verse 5, please. So verse 5, Ahab sends Obadiah to find water for his horses and mules. And verse 6, they go in opposite directions. And I, I think this was true for their minds as well. Ahab was a very wicked king, and Obadiah was, was a righteous man. And both physically and mentally, they were in opposite directions. So on his way, Obadiah meets Elijah, who is finding Ahab. And we can see in verse 7 that he was instantly recognisable. And, Ob- and as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and fell on his face, and said, Art thou my lord, Elijah? We you turn quickly to, with me to chapter, uh, 2 Kings chapter 1, please. We find out in this chapter the sort of clothing that Elijah wore. So 2 Kings chapter 1, and starting with verse 7. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which come up, came up to you, to meet you, and told you these words? And he answered him, He was an hairy man, and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. So Elijah was instantly recognisable by his clothes. He looked different to everyone around him. Now I don't suggest we start wearing girdles of leather. But we can be very different inside to the world around us. And not recognisable to people we walk past. But when we talk to them, we, they should be able to see that we're different inside, that we lead different lives. We can turn back with me to 1 Kings and begin looking at verse 8. So Obadiah answers, I am, um, and he answered him, I am, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. So Elijah asks Obadiah to tell him, tell Ahab that he is here. But Obadiah spends the next six verses explaining to him why going to Ahab was a a terrible idea. But did this put Elijah off? Was he terrified by Obadiah's answer? Let's look at verse 15. And Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, liveth, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So we've heard that phrase before, haven't we, in in chapter 17, verse 1. 
as the um, blood of the Tishbite, who was on the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand. So once again, he's showing his faith and obedience to God, even though Obadiah told him of the hatred the king had towards him. And I'm sure we all know the rest of the chapter quite well. Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal by asking their god Baal to bring fire down from heaven. But I'd still like to look at some of the things that Elijah says and does in this chapter to reinforce his characteristics. So let's start at verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long hold ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. So he asked them how long they hold between two opinions. And this is the same Hebrew word which can be found in verse 26, towards the end. Verse 26. But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar which was made. It, it's the same word. It's this idea of jumping on idea on idea. They can't, they can't settle. And then we read what he says in verse 22 to the people. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. I, even I, only remained. Elijah felt like he was completely alone. And there are many people who were faithful in the Bible that were alone, or at least thought they were alone. And I'd like to look at some of them and see how God was there for them. So we can start off at the start of the Bible. Genesis chapter 6, please. An incredibly faithful man who was completely alone, apart from his family, in the world. Starting at verse 1, Genesis chapter 6. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the son of God, sons of God saw the, the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them, wives of all that which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with them, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. And then we move forward to verse 5. And, the gods, and God saw that the wickedness of men was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And then forward to verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Noah and his family were completely alone, because they were the only, only, only faithful ones left. God wanted to wipe the entire population off the earth, except them. And we see in verse 17, we see that in verse 17. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. And then you turn over the page, chapter 8, verse 1. We see that God remembered Noah, and the waters receded. So God was there for Noah when he thought he was completely alone. Next, I'd like to turn to Daniel. Daniel chapter 3, please. A man and his two friends who were alone in a foreign country. So Daniel chapter 3, reading from verse 4. Then Harold cried out, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. So here we see a, a decree put forth by Nebuchadnezzar. <coughs> but we see in verse 12 that not everyone bowed down. There are certain Jews who now set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not like gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So, we find out in verse 28 what happened to them. Verse 28 of Daniel chapter 3. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel, and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Once, once again, God was there for them in their time of need, when they felt completely alone. And finally, we can turn back to 2 Kings, please. 
2 Kings chapter 6, and here we see Elijah's successor, Elisha, talking to a servant. The second book of Kings, chapter 6, reading from verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And Elisha answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around about Elisha. So this servant felt alone. He felt like he was going to lose, but there was no chance for him. But God showed through Elisha who was with him, all those angels. And I'm sure many of you know those times in the Bible and those, those stories, but you can clearly see how they were completely alone, or at least thought they were alone. And God was there for them. And it's easy for us to feel more confident and faithful when you have your ecclesia and brethren and sisters around you on Sundays and at Bible class. But, and, and you don't feel completely alone because you are around those people that believe the truth. But tomorrow or next week when you're at work or school, it can feel very lonely because you don't have those people around you. And like Elijah, we'll be surrounded by those people who don't believe the truth. But as we have seen, God is always there with us. And our brethren and sisters are just a phone call or a text away. Being lonely can really bring us down, as I'm sure it did for these men. But we can't let that happen because we must remember that hope we have and that God is with us at all times. If you turn back to First Kings chapter 18, please. So we have the, the challenge put forth in verse 23 and 24, that whosoever God would bring down fire would be the true God. And I, I suppose people in the world would, on the face of it, say, how brave, just, just imagine if it hadn't have happened. Or, how courageous, if it failed, he could have died. But there was never an if for Elijah. There was no bravery, no courage. There was faith and trust that the Lord was the one true God and that he would answer the prayer, his prayer and bring down fire. So later on we see Elijah's confidence reach its max when he mocks the prophets when Baal doesn't produce fire. In verse 27. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking or he is pursuing. Or he is in a journey or pay adventure. He sleepeth and must be awake. And, and what a great, le- great lesson for us. And it doesn't mean that we should go around mocking people who don't have the truth. But we should have that faith, that confidence that Elijah had when he challenged those worldly men to be able to mock them. God brings down the fire through prayer in verse 37 and he kills the prophets in verse 40. But now I'd like to turn to the next chapter, chapter 19, and start to look at the first couple of verses there. And here we see that, that someone else wants to kill Elijah now. Chapter 19, verse 1. And they had told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. So here we see after... Here we see Elijah, after seeing God produce fire from heaven, after seeing that cloud that looked like a hand, in chapter 18, verse 44. All this glory from God, but as soon as Jezebel threatens him, he went for his life. Elijah still lacked that little bit of faith. This great man who brought down fire from heaven, who healed the widow's son, still lacked some faith. And you may have noticed that this is the first time recorded that Elijah goes somewhere without God asking him to do it. He's making his own decisions. And can we blame him, his lack of faith? It's easy for us to criticise him, but Jezebel, this this most evil woman, was after him. And yes, he should have trusted God, but he was still of the flesh. His first instinct was to save himself rather than let God do it for him. In verse 4, he carries on. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. It got so bad he wanted to die. 
He had had enough. Elijah wasn't perfect. He was still of the flesh. But, we'll, but we will see his turnaround. So why had he had enough? If we look at verse 10, we'll find out why. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. That's, and they seek my life to take it away. <coughs> so he again thought he was alone. So God shows his great power to him in verse 11 to 13. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and, behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And, behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? So, still he repeats what he said in verse 10 and verse 14. It's exactly the same phrase. He is jealous. He is the only one left. And we are very blessed in this part of the world. Um, in this part of the UK to have an abundance of ecclesias around us. I grew up with my parents taking me to youth days and youth weekends all in reachable distance. And it's hard for us to understand why Elijah would feel this way. But for people who live in isolation in the UK or around the world, they will, they will be able to understand how hopeless Elijah was feeling. So God sends him someone to help him in his life. We begin reading in verse 16. And Jehu, verse 15, And the Lord said unto him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall thou anoint to be a king of Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel and Mehova, shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. So God sends someone to help him in his life, and he is told to anoint Elisha. And what do we read in verse 18? Yet I have left my I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which thou hast which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed. Seven thousand in Israel. Seven thousand people who did not bow unto Baal. He wasn't alone, he just thought he was alone. And it's easy for us to do this. But we know that there are brethren and sisters around the world that can help us. We can't make the same mistake Elijah did. There were people there, he just didn't seek them out. And there's plenty of technologies today that we can, with emails and texts, so we can easily be reminded of our brethren and sisters around the world. And they can be reminded of you, and we should make use of that blessing. So later on in the chapter, he goes to see Elisha. And, in, and what is Elisha doing when he sees him in verse 19? So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him. And he with the twelfth, and Elisha passed by, by him and cast his mantle upon him. So he's plowing with 12 yoke of oxen and this would have brought Elijah's mind back to the altar he built in chapter 18 verse 3 where God was with him and from this he would have realised that God was with this man. And then we carry on in verse 21 and he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. So Elijah, Elisha gave Elijah what he wanted. He ministered unto him. He was his companion. God had supported Elijah by giving him someone that he could minister to and no longer felt alone because of it. And it was very similar to Adam and Eve in Genesis. And we don't read again of Elijah until chapter 21 after Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, has killed Naboth, who had a vineyard near the king's land, so that Ahab could claim his vineyard. And we see him introduced again in verse 17 of 1 Kings chapter 21. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to possess it. So he is once again told to go to the man that he had told no one was going to come. He killed 450 of his prophets, and his wife still wanted to kill him. Elijah's faith and obedience is once again shown by following the Lord's words here, going to that king. And we 
we can see how Ahab felt about Elijah in verse 20. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. So Ahab considered Elijah as his enemy, and the Hebrew word has an idea of hating. Elijah had made this man's life a misery at times. So in verse 22 we read of God's judgment towards Ahab. And will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation, provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger, and made Israel to sin. So we're still not too sure what the judgment is, but if we look in the margin, we can see that next to the house of Jeroboam, we, well, in my Bible, sorry, it's gone to uh, 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 29. And we can see there what, what the judgment was. First Kings chapter 15 verse 29 And it came to pass when he reigned that he smote all the house of Jeroboam he left not to Jeroboam any that breathed until he had destroyed him according unto the saying of the Lord which he spoke by his servant Ahijah the Shilonite So his house was to be destroyed just as Jeroboam's was in First Kings 15 and we see Ahab's response in verse 27 of 1 Kings 21 from what Elijah had said to Ahab. 1 Kings 21 verse 27 And it came to pass, when, when Ahab heard these words, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. So we read as well in verse 27, in verse 29, that he is humbled before God. So he had finally come around. He, he had been evil and now he was recognising it. So what does this tell us about Elijah? He was resilient and he didn't stop till God's work was fulfilled. Right back in 1 Kings 17 verse 1. And could we have this same response from someone in the world? When we first approach people, they could reject us just as Ahab did Elijah. And I doubt they'll search high and wide to hunt you down. But they could completely ignore you. But did this stop Elijah? Yes, sort of, temporarily he, was, he ran away from Jezebel, but he kept trying, and now he had changed Ahab. And I believe we can have this exact same response to people in the world with prayer, faith, and a willing heart. We can change people's lives and give them an opportunity of eternal life in God's kingdom. So within the next chapter, uh, chapter 22, Ahab is slain, and Ahaziah is now king of Israel. And we read in verse 51, read that in verse 51. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned two years over Israel. And what sort of king was Ahaziah? Read it in the next verse. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the way of his father, and in the way of his mother, and the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. So we know what sort of king Ahaziah was. And we see in the, the second book of Kings, chapter 1, verse 2, Ahaziah fell down through the lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go, inquire of Baal-zebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. And incidentally, Ahaziah's name means Yah has seized. But clearly, Ahaziah hadn't seized Yahweh. He had done what Yahweh had done to him. So he fell in and is now sick. So Elijah is told to go and meet these messengers in verse 3. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a god in Israel that ye go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? So they go back and tell Ahaziah. And we have, we've touched on this before, but we see in verse 8 that he is instantly recognisable. Um, and they answered him, He was a hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. And in verse 9, we look at verse 9, And the king sent unto him a captain of fifty, with his fifty, and he went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of an hill, and he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath said, come down. So again, we hear that phrase, man of God. And over the next couple of verses, fire is sent down from heaven again, 
to slay the captain and his 50, and then another captain and his 50. But the third captain has a different response in verse 15. But in verse 14, he, he begs Elijah for to save his life. In verse 15, the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. So God asks him to go down to these men, these 51 armed men of the people, after he had just killed a hundred just moments ago. Would we have that faith? Well, we, we can and we, sh- we should, just as Elijah did. Now in chapter 2, we start off finding what's going to happen to Elijah in that verse. Chapter 2 and verse 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into into heaven by whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. So he's then told by God to visit two places on the way to Jordan, and possibly to bid farewell to his brethren, the brethren that he didn't believe existed back in the days of Jezebel and Ahab. We read that in in verse 2. And towards the end of verse 2, Elijah asks Elisha, um, Elisha asks Elijah, you're going to have to bear with me, Elisha and Elijah. Tricky. Um, so Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. So Elisha asked, Eli- Elijah asked Elisha not to go with him, but Elisha still went with him. So they go down to the river Jordan, and Elisha, Elijah uses his mantle to cross it. And when on the other side, Elijah asks Elisha, Elisha a question. We look at verse 9. And it came to pass when they had gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. So Elijah wants to know what Elisha wanted in terms of the power of God could give him and what he needed to carry on his work. And at the end of verse 9 we find out what Elisha wanted. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. So an extraordinary blessing that Elijah acknowledges he can't give in, in verse 10. That was asked a hard thing. But it can only be given by God. And Elisha asked for a double portion. And does this mean that he wanted to be twice as faithful or twice as good as Elijah? I, I don't think so. If you turn with me to Deuteronomy, please. We see where the double portion is used and who it's given to. Deuteronomy chapter 21, please. Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse 17 But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath for he is the beginning of his strength the right of the firstborn firstborn is his So the double portion was reserved for the firstborn Elisha wants to be the heir to Elijah an heir to the prophetic office We can turn back to 2 Kings please so we see 2 Kings chapter 2, Elijah is, is taken up in verse 11, and then not to be preserved in heaven till Christ returns, but to another place. Please turn with me to John chapter 3, please. And here we read about who goes to and from heaven, and you'll see Elijah didn't go to the place where God dwells. John chapter 3, verse 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So we see there that Elijah didn't go to heaven, but just into the sky, and then eventually died, as, as all men do. But he does re- reappear in the Bible, quoted regularly in Christ's life, and appear to him in the Transfiguration, in Matthew 17, where he represents the prophets, alongside Moses, who represented the law. And within the Hebrews, if you could turn with me there, finally, please, Please. Hebrews chapter 11 to that list of things that this people of faith had done we can look through them and see the things that Elijah did in that list so verse 33 Hebrews 11 who through faith subdued kingdoms wrought righteousness, obtained promises stopped the mouth of lions quenched the violence of fire Escaped the edge of the sword. He definitely escaped from Jezebel. 
Out of the weakness were made strong, he was, he was alone and he was still strong. Max the valiant, valiant in the fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and we've looked at that before. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were st- sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskin. We know that Elijah was a, a man of the wilderness, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. So we see there a good description of Elijah in certain things. I'm sorry, it's not quite the last thing. If you could just turn with me a couple of pages, pages to James chapter 5, please. We read of Elijah in James chapter 5 and verse 17. Elias, or Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that he might not reign, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave, ra- the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him. Let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. So Elijah was a great man who overcame much adversity and was faithful and obedient until his carrying away. He changed the land that he lived in, the land that he didn't belong in. We don't belong here. We live for that day to come as Elijah did. And may that day be soon. Thank you. Thank you.